It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to American Forum. As the Obama administration approaches its final year, the president's foreign policy legacy may rest on the fate of the recently negotiated nuclear agreement between Iran, the U.S., and other world powers. Supporters of the deal say it will reduce Iran's nuclear enrichment capacity by more than two-thirds and eliminate its ability to eventually build nuclear weapons. Critics say the agreement is fatally flawed, a reckless deal with a devil, with a country that backs terrorism, can't be trusted, and hates America, Israel, and the West. Our guest today is the American diplomat who led the two-year negotiation with Iran and serves as the third highest ranking State Department official. Ambassador Wendy Sherman has had a storied career in international diplomacy and at the highest levels of American leadership. She was a member of the U.S. team that attempted to negotiate a nuclear arms deal with North Korea in the 1990s, a top advisor to President Bill Clinton and four secretaries of state, and was a vocal ally of Hillary Clinton during her 2008 bid for the Democratic presidential nomination. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Doug. Glad to be here. We'll walk through the elements of the deal and the arguments for and against it as, as we go through the, the next half hour. But there seems to be one really fundamental issue that is bigger than all the others and beneath all of the others. And that is essentially, how can the American people, how can the United States trust a government that has aggressively supported international terrorism, held many of our citizens as hostages uh, in an incident that we still remember so vividly, uh, and continues through its leaders often to talk about the destruction of the United States, the destruction of Israel. Can we really believe in any deal, whatever its elements are, with a regime like that? Well, you know, I share that skepticism and I share that mistrust uh, for all of the reasons that you say. And this agreement is not based on trust. This agreement is based on verification, uh, intrusive monitoring uh, and inspections and knowing, in fact, what is actually going to take place here and to hold in our hand all of the options we have today if Iran doesn't comply and if things don't go the way we hope they will because of this agreement. You know, when people talk about the death to America, death to Israel, uh, I also experienced this firsthand. It wasn't very easy for me or my family uh, for the beginning of this uh, process. On the streets of Tehran, they said death to Wendy Sherman, too. So I take it pretty personally, and I understand the concern and the anxiety for what Iran does throughout the region and the world. But quite frankly, all of those things would be a whole heck of a lot worse if Iran had a nuclear weapon, because then they could deter us from taking the actions we need to stop the very malign things they do in the region. Beyond the fact that it's highly disputed, and that one side says it's a disaster and the other side says it's great, beyond that, I think a lot of Americans don't really understand exactly what it does or how it works. So why don't you briefly take us through the, the basic elements of the agreement? Sure. So Iran has 19,000 centrifuges. Those are the tools for enriching uranium and uranium becomes, highly enriched uranium becomes what's called the fissile material for a nuclear weapon. Similarly, they have an, a reactor called ARAK, A-R-A-K, that is a plutonium reactor that could make weapons grade plutonium, which also can be used as fissile material for a nuclear weapon. We wanted to stop all of that. We would prefer that Iran have no enrichment, no reactors, uh, that it get all of its fuel for any civil nuclear program from outside of the country. Iran refused to do that. The Bush administration tried to negotiate that. They could not get it done. And in fact, you really can't get rid of what Iran knows. They know how to do this enrichment. They know how to build a reactor. And so even if you took military action, it would only set their program back for maybe two or three years. Because they know how to do what they know how to do, they could do it all over again. So what President Obama decided 
was that if we could negotiate an agreement with very, very strict limits on their program, with tremendous verification and monitoring and inspections, so we knew everything that was going on, we could shut down all the pathways to the material needed for a nuclear weapon. So that enriched uranium pathway, the pathway for weapons-grade plutonium, and importantly, a covert pathway. What if they did something in secret? Could we put together a monitoring scheme that would ensure that they could not covertly do what they are now doing overtly? That is what we have done. We have shut down every pathway uh, to fissile material for a nuclear weapon. We have the verification and monitoring to make sure that we have done so. In return for that, because there's always a quid pro quo in any negotiation, Iran will get, in a phased-in way, relief from the very effective sanctions that we and the international community have put in place. And the agreement allows for the international community uh, to perform inspections that would verify that these actions are actually being taken. There is uh, an international organization called the International Atomic Energy Agency. And it is the organization that for all of the countries that are part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the United States is one of them, uh, of course, there are um, 189 countries, I believe. Um, for all of those countries, it does all the inspections and all the monitoring. The IAEA, as it is called, has access not only to sites that the world knows about, but to any sus suspicious site anywhere in Iran. So that's what they have signed up to. Now, what we've put in this actual agreement on top of all of those kinds of inspection regimes are, are some very specific uh, requirements. Uh, IAEA inspectors can be in all of the declared known facilities 24-7, every day of the week, every hour of the day. Those facilities will have real-time data transmission, so human beings cannot mess with it, and the IAEA will know what's going on. Is it true, uh, despite the things that you've just said, that Iran will have 24 hours notice of any inspections and will actually be in a position to spirit away things if, if they wish to conceal them? Um, people have used this term anytime, anywhere inspections. How come we don't have anytime, anywhere inspections in Iran? Anytime, anywhere inspections don't exist anywhere in the world. The only time that has existed is in the situation with Iraq. And in Iraq, we were occupiers in that country. Uh, that was a country that surrendered. Uh, that's not the situation here. We're talking about a sovereign country where the government, as much as we may not like it, is still in place. Under the additional protocol, the IAEA can give 24 hours notice and can then get into any facility they believe they need to. They have to show justification because you can't just say, well, I can go anywhere onto any military site for any reason. Any country would be worried we learn their conventional military secrets. So they have to say why. If five out of the eight of us vote that the IAEA should get access, and remember, United States, UK, France, Germany, European Union, that's five votes right there, so we'd probably get our way, then Iran only has three days and they have to give access. Secretary Moniz has said, and our labs have validated, that even if it takes as long as 24 days, there is no way in 24 days in 24 months, maybe even in 24 years, to hide traces of enriched uranium. They will be found. There will be cameras that will tell us what's happening. Something called electronic seals, which is a technology that allows information to flow to the IAEA. In addition to that, for 20 years, Iran will have to show the IAEA everything it's doing in the production of what's called centrifuge rotors and bellows. Those are the actual parts of a centrifuge that make them work. So they won't be able to create a covert supply chain because we'll be watching everything they do in their centrifuge production. For 25 years, from the time uranium comes out of the ground until it's milled, until it becomes gas that goes into a centrifuge, there will be what's called uranium accountancy. The IAEA will watch every step of that process. They will know where every ounce of that uranium is. 
so they can't divert that to a covert process. That Iraq reactor, that plutonium reactor, the core of it, which is called a calandria, will be pulled out and filled with concrete. So it cannot be used. And that reactor will be modified so that it can only produce plutonium that is not weapons grade and does not produce a threat. So all of these actions coming together really create quite a web of verification, monitoring, inspections uh, that will assure us that the pathway to highly enriched uranium, the pathway to weapons grade plutonium, and a covert pathway are all shut down. And if we find any acts of noncompliance, we can react to them by reimposing pieces of sanctions or all of sanctions, both our unilateral, those with our partners, and those at the UN. How different is this arrangement from what you went into the first hour of negotiation two years ago hoping to achieve? Well, when we started this two years ago, we knew that we were talking about severe limits on their program, that we did not we were not going to be able to simply wipe out their program. And because they know how to do what they know how to do, they could reconstitute it anyway. Uh, we had hoped, I think, a lot of people had hoped, not, I think we were pretty realistic, but a lot of people had hoped we could get them to get rid of all of their facilities. We didn't do that, but we have constrained all their facilities. Part of the criticism of the deal, and part of what we've heard a lot from in terms of the opponents of this, uh, has essentially been an assertion that while this all sounds good, particularly when you present it so articulately, uh, but that somehow, uh, in fact, you and the others involved in this were hoodwinked by the Iranians. What I say to people about that is I wish you were as worried about today as you are worried about 15 years from now. Iran today is what some people call a nuclear threshold state. Uh, Iran today has the know-how to enrich uranium and create weapons-grade plutonium to build a nuclear weapon. So why aren't the folks who are worried about 15 years from now as worried about today? This agreement stops Iran's ability to, have to acquire a nuclear weapon and does it forever. Iran has made a commitment never to acquire a nuclear weapon. So if they take any step in that direction, we can act. And all of the options that we have today, sanctions, even military action, we have tomorrow. So we're really not giving up our ability to act. What we are doing is putting in place an agreement that ensures that Iran will not acquire a nuclear weapon today, or for the future, or forever. What was the thing that the United States conceded on that was most painful to you to concede on? And what was it that the Iranians gave up in return for that concession? What we tried to work out is ensuring that Iran would take a whole series of nuclear steps. And only then would they get any relief from the sanctions. In the first instance, we'll lift those sanctions, but they will not be finally terminated. And the sanctions will not get terminated until many years later. It will take acts of Congress to terminate those sanctions so that they can always be snapped back because they will still be in place, just in essence suspended for a period of time. And so where in that is the concession from the United States and a concession <laughs> from Iran? Well, I think, uh, quite frankly, it's not worthwhile to talk about who gave what where because what I think is important is where did we end up? Did we meet our objective? And our objective was to shut down all the pathways to a nuclear weapon. And I have to say, Doug, you know, I don't know what will happen with Iran in the future. Uh, I think uh, no one can predict whether they'll come into the international community in the ways that some people hope, or whether they will stay as difficult as they currently are. But I will say this, the majority of the people in Iran are under the age of 25. They're, they weren't part of the revolution uh, some uh, three plus decades ago. And they are on social media and they know what the rest of the world is like and they'd like a different future for their country. Let's talk through some of the criticisms uh, more specifically since we won't go into the, the back and forth of the negotiation. But uh, let me just ask you some specific things. Is it true that Iran will be allowed to inspect itself? No. Uh, the Director General of the IAEA, uh, Mr. Romano, uh, said a few days ago that all of those stories uh, misrepresented what will occur. 
It would undermine, of course, the credibility of the IAEA if they let people inspect themselves. We had a team of about 15 of us who have been doing this for 15 years, for two, 15 years, it feels like that, for two years. But we were backed up literally by hundreds of American scientists and experts who helped us work through all of the incredible details that are required for such an agreement. Is it true that Iran will get to approve or disapprove the members of these inspection teams, including whether Americans would be, part, be, be a part of those inspection teams? What the agreement says is that Iran will accept inspectors with whom they have countries with whom they have diplomatic relations. So Americans, so for Americans now won't be, won't part, of be part of that. But, you know, if you think about it in common sense terms, having somebody who you don't have diplomatic relationship with in your country, uh, you could see how that would be uneasy. However, it's important for Americans to know that we train here in the United States virtually every inspector for the IAEA because we have the skills and the techniques and the ability to do that. And we have many Americans who work at the IAEA who are part of the Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, a part of the team, as it were. So we are involved every day in every way as Americans, even though we won't be the inspectors on the ground. Is it true that even if all of these provisions are complied with by Iran, that there will be this release of funds, uh, whether it's 100 billion or 180 billion or 200 billion, whatever that number exactly is, uh, but that there will be this gigantic cash infusion that Iran will enjoy the benefit of, and, uh, and in the minds of many people, that that could well be used to finance terrorism and other kinds of acts uh, against the United States and our allies. Is that a true statement? So let me break that down for everybody. <clears throat> Iran has assets that are frozen in banks around the world, not in any U.S. banks, uh, but in banks in Japan, in the United Arab Emirates, in India, and a variety of other places, South Korea. Those are assets that were frozen because of the sanctions that have been in place. So it's Iran's money that have been frozen in those accounts. Secretary Liu, our Secretary of Treasury, uh, did analysis, as did our intelligence community. And although there's about $100 billion in those frozen accounts, only about $56 billion is available in liquid assets for Iran to make use of. The others are in non-performing loans <laughs> or in loans to China. So of that $56 billion, they can make use of it. Now, that's a lot of money, and there's reason to be concerned that the um, IRGC, which is the military of Iran, might make use of it to do more bad things in the region. But Iran has about a half a trillion dollar hole to make up in order to get their economy back to where it would be today if these sanctions had not been in place. So, our assessment, the intelligence community's assessment, is will a little of that money perhaps go to the IRGC? In all likelihood, some part of it will. But the vast majority of it, we believe, will be used in Tehran, in Iran, to improve the economy. You say that the deal is not based on trust, but on these enforcement provisions. Uh, nonetheless, every negotiation has to involve some degree of confidence in the good faith or some level of good faith of the people on the other side of the table, it's to some degree, but maybe that's not the case. But how confident are you, how confident did you become in the end, uh, in whether there is any good faith at all, particularly on, on the part of President Hassan Rouhani? Well, to tell you the truth, there's nothing about this that's based on faith by Iran or by us. Uh, and Iran has to take all of the nuclear steps that are required, and only when they have done that are we suspending sanctions. We'll tee it all up so we're ready to do it once they've taken those steps, uh, but there is no trust here. Uh, you know, I tell some people the story, we obviously, once you negotiate with someone for two years, you come to know them pretty well, and the uh, lead negotiator beyond, below the foreign ministers, because obviously the foreign ministers weren't there every time we had a negotiating round for these two years, uh, but uh, my opposite and I both had grandchildren during this year. So there might be one minute where we would share videos of our grandchildren, very human moment, and the next minute be sitting across the table from each other, totally mistrustful 
totally ensuring that we had the verification we needed, even yelling at each other, even walking out of the room, even threatening to say the negotiation's over. There were at least on three occasions where Secretary Kerry uh, said, you know, we're done. We're done. You're not doing what's necessary here. We're done. So there is not trust here. After three plus decades of mistrust, it is going to take a very, very long time and a lot of change in Iran's behavior, a lot of change, for there to be any trust built. So this agreement has nothing to do with trust. It has everything to do with transparency, verification, monitoring, knowing what is happening, and our ability to act regardless of what occurs. Let's go beyond the negotiating table in terms of players who are nonetheless a part of this, uh, in terms of good faith, levels of confidence. Do you believe in the good faith of Benjamin Netanyahu? Of course I do. Look. The irony of all of this is that every step of the way, uh, we have consulted with our Israeli counterparts. Israel has enormous expertise in this field, enormous. Uh, and so I had, and my team, countless meetings with Israeli experts, uh, countless secure video conferences. Uh, they came to Washington. I and my team went to Israel. So yes, I, they have tremendous capability, tremendous know-how, and we made really good use of it. Use them to validate ideas or get critiques on ideas. At the end of the day, I completely understand that the prime minister has to make the judgment he thinks is right from his perspective for his country, just as President Obama has to make a judgment for the national security of the United States, and Congress is going to have a say about that through the corker Cardin legislation. So, of course, I think that the Prime Minister uh, has good faith, and so do we. Then why is all this perceived so differently by so many people in Israel, including the Prime Minister? Well, you know, Israel lives in this region. It lives in a really lousy neighborhood, uh, and its security is under threat all of the time. And I believe that most people in Israel, and I understand it, wanted this agreement to take care of all the problems with Iran so that Iran wouldn't be funding Hezbollah that has rockets aimed at Israel, that this agreement would have taken care of state sponsorship of terrorism and dealt with the human rights abuses in Iran. I understand that. I wish one agreement could do all of those things, but one agreement cannot. Are we also living in a time in which diplomacy is significantly hamstrung by the political atmosphere of the country? How much of a factor was it in terms of the Iran negotiations when uh, Congress, Congress, certain members of Congress put out a letter saying before the deal was done saying that they would not support it, it wouldn't be uh, approved by Congress, or when Prime Minister Netanyahu was invited to speak to the Congress without uh, consultation of the White House, uh, or even comments like that of uh, Mike Huckabee, the, one of the GOP candidates recently, about that this deal uh, is escorting uh, Jews of the world to the doors of the, uh, of the ovens. So we're in the middle of a presidential political season which tends to increase the heat of rhetoric. Um, I think most Americans wish we had a more civil conversation about everything we're doing. There are people who disagree. We should have those disagreements as respectfully as we can, because at the end of the day, what each of us should be cared about is what is in our national security interest. That's what patriotism is really about. There are some out there, many people actually, who would say that not only is this uh, a bad deal on the merits, uh, on the contents of the agreement, but that even beyond that, that the president, the people who've represented him in this in this negotiation, uh, weren't just hoodwinked, but that are not patriots, that those of you who did this deal somehow hate America. <laughs> what would you say to those people? I'd say that's absurd on its face. But those arguments should be based on facts. There is so much misinformation out there about this agreement, extraordinary misinformation. And I think that misinformation is out there, partly because people don't understand it. It's quite a difficult technical agreement. But that misinformation is out there for political reasons, because it serves political ends. And I think most Americans would like all of us who are officials or political leaders to be worried about their day-to-day -day lives, uh, to be focused on getting uh, the work done 
to finding solutions to the needs of our families and our workers and to the national security of our country. That's what the President's committed to do. That's what Secretary Kerry's committed to do. That's what I'm committed to do. Ambassador Wendy Sherman, thanks for being with us. Thank you. We hope you'll join the conversation with American Forum and our guests by following us on Facebook or Twitter at Miller underscore Center or at Douglas Blackman. To send us a comment about this program or download podcasts or transcripts, visit us at millercenter.org, American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. See you next week. <laughs>